we are, and it's time for the Game Sports Show. It is your host, David McKay Jr., bringing you another special edition upload powered by the Game Entertainment and Media and sponsored by Little Caesars Pizza. Now, getting to our Little Caesars special edition co-host here for tonight's upload, you know him by now, I'm sure. Okay, former professional hockey player of over 1,000 games, hockey analyst for TGEM, Brendan Brooks. Brooksy, how's it going, pal? It's going really good. It's uh, great to be here. I'm so excited about the show today. I uh, just want to get it started so we can uh, hear all these great stories. Well, everyone knows that my introduction is usually quite long, but I'm going to make this one brief yet very effective. And now getting to not one, but two guests for today's show. These guests brought to you by Little Caesars Pizza. And what an absolute treat we have here today. Okay, it's absolutely wild. And as mentioned, it's not only one guest, it is two guests, two legends, one of which drafted first round, second overall 1971 by the Red Wings, whom has played in over 1,000 NHL games, scored 731 goals, 1,040 assists. For, for a total of 1,771 points. He's a Hall of Famer, six all-time in goals, six all-time in points, 11th all-time in assists, two-time world uh, championship, and then bronze medal Canada Cup champion, uh, receiver of the Lester Patrick Award, and winner of the Art Ross Trophy, and two-time Ted Lindsay and Lady Bing Trophy winner as well. Uh, he's also a member of the known Triple Crown line, and even beat Wayne Gretzky in scoring in a season as well. Fun fact, as we sit here in the Gretzky corner of the game entertainment and media. The second guest, another first round pick, second overall by the Red Wings, but in 1963 played in 884 NHL games, turning 88 goals, 485 assists, 773 points, and he wasn't afraid to get some pims either, okay? Two-time AHL champion, notably Canada Cup champion, and four-time, yes, four-time Stanley Cup winner with the Montreal Canadiens, also was a part of scouting in the NHL post-career as well. Now, both these guests are inducted into the Canada Sports Hall of Fame, unreal resumes, and I can just go on and on about, but enough of that. I said not as long as an intro, so let's bring in these guests who truly do not need no more of an introduction, Marcel Dion and Pete Mahovlich. Marcel, Pete, absolutely pumped to have you both on here today. Well, thank you so much. I, uh, everything that you said about me, I think that's the first time I've, I heard this. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> <isn't> it? <laughs> Marcel, I am going to say one thing. I've always been impressed with you. There's no question about it. And the fact that you and I both were drafted uh, uh, in the first round by the Detroit Rings, Red Wings just tells us an awful lot about how smart they were. <laughs> <laughs> You see, and honestly, it's the impressive resumes all around, okay? And, like, you know, I always told Brooksy, like, he was, I believe uh, Brooksy was a, actually a Buffalo fan, but he was obviously played in the Red Wings organization. And I was asking him while before we went on, I said, between the two of them, who should we expect that's going to want more of the airtime, okay? Is it, who's going to be wanting more of this airtime, or are we going to be able to equal it out? That's very interesting. I'll tell you right now. Uh, you know what? Uh, this is phenomenal what you're doing. And uh, uh, hockey has been a great part of our lives. And uh, we're spending, uh, it's always nice to see Peter spending time and his wife and his family and so on. And, but you know what? It's really sad. We're losing a lot of players. I remember when I was in Detroit, uh, being 20 years old, Alex Ovecchio was and already 18 years in the NHL. I said, how can that be? And now that I'm 70 years old, all my heroes that I watch as a kid, the Montreal Canadiens and all these guys, <laughs> well, you forget you get there. You know, you see when yeah. a, an athlete that's 70 years old, you say, look at him, he's so old. I'm going, not true. I feel really <laughs> good. I got a lot of energy, but I can't play hockey anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You see, and honestly, it's so different the game now as it was then, though. And honestly, it was better then than it is now. And so I know someone you watch like Connor McDavid, who burns down the wing at 110 miles an hour, you know, you're, you're astounded. But, you know, if you look at him, if, if he would have played in the 60s, 70s and 80s, if he goes in the corner with someone like Peter Mahovlich or heck, even Bobby Orr knew how to uh, get a little bit feisty. Peter, I know you know that <laughs> better than some people, but it was still very... Uh, it's it's different game as it was then as it is now. I can't believe how much different it is. Well, it is, and, and in a lot of areas, uh, the game uh, did not get any better. But in so many other areas, uh, the game did improve. I think what we did didn't want to see is all the uh, the bench clearing brawls and all the the hooliganism that, that did went on. 
uh, the players today are bigger, stronger, better than uh, than we are, and that's all. That's generational through uh, through time and 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 through every sport. But one of the things that uh, always uh, stayed the same and has always been constant for me is the fact that we as uh, hockey players growing up, uh, lifetime friendships uh, have, have been made through uh, through through different things and the, through different teammates for different reasons. Uh, so you you see us sitting here today, Marcel and I. We never had the opportunity to play uh, together on a team other than our uh, Canada Cup in 1976 and our Team Canada 1972. But I also had the wonderful pleasure of uh, uh, coaching myself for a game. And anyways, uh, he was with the Rangers and he and I, uh, I was working for the Rangers at one time. And uh, the one thing about it was didn't matter where he was or what he was doing, he loved to play the game. And that was the most important thing that uh, I keep passing on to anybody that, that decides to try to do this for a living. Just enjoy the game and uh, it'll be your friend for life. Love that. Marcel, I'm sure you got to bounce back for that. <laughs> well, here's what I'm going to tell you. I, uh, it depends on your audience. I totally understand what you said about the game changing. But at the same time, you have to accept it. It is what it is. For me, and you can go back to Peter, because he stayed in the game for a long time as a, uh, as a scout and uh, part of some uh, teams as management. So he's seen a lot, of, a lot of players play. For me, there's two things what really changed the game. Removing the red line and the high glass. The high glass was for safety measure Yep. But guess what? Here's what I'm going to tell you. What you said about Connor McDavid, it doesn't matter. He could have played in at any time. The only difference is that you cannot go in the days I play with that red line 100 miles an hour because the defensemen stood up and they were ready to hit you yep. or you had to make finesse, finesse plays. Now they're coming 100 miles an hour. And that's where you see some of these really big hits and guys end up with severe concussions. The high glass was made, obviously, for safe uh, measure, which is good. I, I, I really understand that. But the defensemen, when they don't have a play, what do you think they do? Get rid of it. Get rid of the glass. The guys are 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and they still got hit on the head by a puck. <laughs> so if you just take those two things, for me, I like to see, at one time, training camp, and just for the guys that play the American Hockey League to try to play with a red line, that means you have to stop. Stop and start. You, there's no, remember, it's got to be a two-line pass. Yeah. Yep. That's my way of looking at the game. If you want to compare how much it is today, I guarantee you this, the fourth line today are much better skaters than our fourth line when we played. Because <laughs> Phyllis Pusino, for example, we stay on the ice for one shift, nine minutes. Now they're still, what, 40 seconds, they're gone. You watch them, yeah. they're sitting, they play 40 seconds. And he used to have oh. just a, a coffee and a cigarette probably in between intermissions too. <laughs> well, he didn't, but a lot of our other friends did. But anyways, uh, Mar Marcel is absolutely right about the red line. The other big change too, uh, and again, the glass is a big thing, like you said, yeah. uh, two truths. But the, the, the third one I would have uh, instituted was to, uh, and again, they, they just felt that there was too many offsides going on and they tried to, the, this nonsense about the, uh, the tag up rule, okay? If, if they take that tag up rule, your entry into the play, if you're offside on your entry play, the face off goes just outside the blue line. But if the puck comes out of the zone and you throw it back in and it's offside, there's no tag up. That face off goes back deep into the offensive, into your own zone, into your zone. Your team has to stay on the ice and the other team has the ability to change. Yeah. All of a sudden that creates a problem for the, the team that has that created that situation. Some of their players would be tired, right? 
It's, instead, you, how many, how often do you see a team get trapped in their own zone? They keep dumping it in, they keep dumping it in. They can't get off the ice, especially in, in the second period when they switch ends. Long so it, it's all, it's all part of a, uh, a coaching strategy that they, that they implement. If, if this rule gets into effect, right? The defense all of a sudden has to start backing up. They have to be making plays. They start fumbling and around turnovers. Next thing you know, you've got offensive chances at the far zone, at the far end. But anyways, there's a lot of things that could be done to improve the game. They've made these changes, and now sometimes they're afraid to make them. But one thing I, I know for sure, whatever changes they do make, there will be one or two good coaches that figure it out, take advantage of it. There's always your Roger Nielsen's and, and all these guys that, that figured these. Scotty Bowman was, was a master at figuring things out. And, and how, what, how are we going to play this guy? How are we going to do this? What are we going to do this? Like everybody thought it was, it was important to get on to Bobby Orr and early and uh, uh, try to attack him early with two and three players. Well, that wasn't the answer. The answer was let him carry the puck, clogged up the middle zone, and if he's got nobody to pass it to, well, sooner or later, he's going to be bumping into his own players or one of us, and, and it takes away his speed. But before that, he would pass the puck, beat two or three guys, get the puck back in the neutral zone in speed, and bang, he was in and gone. But uh, one of the things we, we do know is uh, great players of today would be playing at any time, as the great players of yesteryear would be playing today and being effective today. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you guys brought up, obviously, Canada, uh, playing there at, uh, you know, with Team Canada and that experience there in 72 and 76. I really want to talk about it because it's a big part of the hockey history. And I just want to hear a little bit about your guys' experience during that time. Well, 72 was a, a, a magical year, but we go on um, the 50 years next September that we played that series. So a lot of people were in the stars. But what I can tell you about 76, uh, then we were really aware how great, how great the Re uh, European players were. And uh, when I saw the Russians in 1972, because they were competing, it's called the national team. Everybody says that, we, we, we all agreed that said, no, they're any child players, right? But uh, Pete can tell you, they were magical hockey players. They were just absolutely incredible. But 76, what happened, now we knew, then we added other countries. So that's what really made it exciting that you have a, a, a set of nations where we build it and we played against the Czechs in the final. So you had the Swedes, you had the US team, and uh, suddenly it was just like, Wow, this is unbelievable. This is not only the Canadian game, it belongs to a lot of players. And what I can tell you, that's a magical thing that what Ovechkin is doing. If you ever, ever think a Russian player could go on and beat the Wayne Gretzky's record for most goals, is that, is, is that amazing? It's an, I, I, well, here's it's what so it is. When I, it when I turned pro with Detroit, a uh, couple of players told me, he says, Marcel, uh, Gordie Howe's record, because when he, he retired, will never be broken. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It didn't take long for Wayne Gretzky, right, to just fine. Right. And okay. then when you, when you think of that, so, so what you got to figure, Gordie says, well, that's not good enough. If that's going to happen, he played six more years in the <laughs> WHA with his two sons, Mark and Marty. How can that be? That you could <laughs> never beat that. So he made sure said, you can talk all you want. Yeah. Unbelievable. And he got a amount of goals. I don't know how many more of those over 300 points. I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah, phenomenal. He played with him. I just saw him in his last year, but uh, different breed, different breed. Uh, See, and Pete, you're, talking about, you're talking about Gordie Howe. Yeah. Now, this is a true story. Now, uh, my very first trip to uh, to the NHL was on December the 28th, 1965. I played in Boston Gardens. I was playing for the Hamilton Red Wings at the time, 
and they, they needed a couple of players and they couldn't get them from their American League farm team, which was in Pittsburgh at the time. So they called me up and said, uh, the, the 28th, we'd like you to go and play a game in, in Boston. Of course I did. But the following year, I got signed by the Detroit Red Wings at 20 years old, got to play. And I, I was a left winger at the time. And I had these two frumpy old guys as my line mates. One guy was Alex Dalvecchio and the other guy was Gordie Howe. They were my two first two line mates. And they were, it was just like we were all 10 years old. That was, that's the magical part of all this. They, they, were, they loved the game. They enjoyed the game. They, they worked with me. We, we didn't have uh, coaches now like they have today where you have a, 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 a skills coach and a goaltending coach and a, and a skating coach. We learned if, 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 if the players had any decency, they helped the younger players. And Gordy and Alex had all the decency in the world along with a real special person I have to mention was Andy Bathke was in, in, and he would stay out on the ice and show me how to back, backhand a pass, receive a pass, so on and so forth, and uh, how to saucer a pass, all these different things that uh, skill coaches teach now. But that's, that's where we learn how to play our game from the players that, uh, that we analyzed. See, and you both, all right, obviously wore the, the crest. And the, people say, uh, and I've heard from friends that have played in the Olympics, friends that play the Spangler. Brooks, I think you have experience at the Spangler, but I believe it was with Britain, uh, top of my head. No, no. No, it was no, Canada. I played with Canada. I it was Canada. Canada. Okay. Yeah. It was oh, Canada. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Correct myself. Uh, Europe was, uh, was for the world. See, well, that is Britain. Either way, when you get sometimes have that chance to win and represent your country, some people have said that's the biggest achievement that you can get. There are other achievements in hockey, obviously, where, you know, it's making it or winning the cup. There's a lot of other things. But representing your country is obviously a highlight for lots. And 72 is a historic and pivotal uh, moment, especially in Canadian hockey history. You could talk about Phil Esposito's famous comments in 72 where he was disappointed with the fans, right? And Phil Esposito has close ties where, of course, where the game entertainment media is home-based in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. So there's a lot of uh, knowledge here in the Sioux uh, for Phil Esposito and his brother, of course. But you you have the fans that were booing and it's almost like being a Toronto Maple Leaf fan in the national hockey league nowadays, booing their own players. Uh, but jokes aside, Phil Esposito's comments, you know, that altered the series, right? And Pete, you arguably next to Henderson scored the biggest goal, or should I even say the nicest goal in that series? You absolutely dangled the D man. I forget who it was. Uh, you, you basically, he's still looking for his jock trap. So it's Tretiak. Okay. Like they're both still looking for it. They have no idea where it is since 72 to now. Okay. Like that, those moments that are either still watched. It's one of those things that you can sit back and sit and say to yourself, they'll be talking about this series for 50 years. 100 years, 200 years, and that's how historic it was. And getting that dangle goal must have been a good feeling, and both of you playing together in 76 must have been a treat too. Because, Marcel, if I'm correct, you didn't play in 72, but you were on the team. Yeah, sort of, but uh, hold it now. How old were you in 1972? Do I, <laughs> I, just, I just got you, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a 91 birth year. I'll be oh, honest. But you're good. <laughs> hey, you're yeah. not, you're not, that's good. You have no fear yeah. and you ask the right questions. So you've done your homeworks. But let me tell you, it's just that uh, it was absolutely the greatest event that you should add with that, that for the Canadian people, the whole country, the last game. This is true story. Canada stopped. The kids were watching the television and the gym, the people on the street. That, you, know, you remember this? And the, the, not too many people had colored TVs in those days. So <laughs> you, we didn't know, but we knew by the mail and all the messages that we got. And I knew when we, I was asked to go that there was going to be something there. That, the atmosphere was that, yeah, we're going to beat them eight straight and how wrong we, everybody was. But I'll tell you, uh, Paul Henderson was at my house uh, last week and I had a good time with him. I play golf once in a while, but you know what? 
he still is stuck with that gold. <laughs> Don't stop talking about it. I, would, I don't know I'd if be you guys knew Dennis Hall. He, he's, he's been a really good uh, comedian on the tour. He said that he was next when Paul jumped on the ice and scored that goal. Dennis Hall said, that was him that was supposed to go. And somebody held him back. He would have been famous. <laughs> but I'm telling you guys, this was during the Cold War. Yeah, good point. What we saw as human beings, and I had the chance to see a lot, and we peaked. And I'll tell you one, just one thing. I'll never forget that. We're on the bus, and Bobby Orr was there. And uh, couldn't play. I just His knee was not proper. We're on the bus, and all the kids just around the bus in Canada, Canada, Canada. And the guys brought, we were told, bring a lot of candies, a lot of sweet, because they didn't have that. But all the soldiers are around. They won't let these little guys come in, right? I saw Bobby Orr get up, and he's right in front of the bus. He said, he said, Phil, let's go out there. Let's go take care of them. I was, I got still have goosebumps. They both walked out of there, and they were giving the chocolate, the gum. And then the soldiers, as soon as they went on the floor, the kid grabbed it, they just stepped right on their hands. It was devastating to see, are you kidding me? And, and Pete can go on and on and on tell you, that human side of it, it was democracy, freedom against communism. So now that we talk about sports, we get into yeah. politics. Yeah, it doesn't right. change, right? It doesn't change. Yeah. Well said, well said. Further to the point on what Marcel was talking about, 72 was uh, uh, pretty special in a lot of ways. Uh, again, we never thought that we'd be sitting here uh, now 49 years later talking so, so passionately about it. But uh, two things we have to remember. One, yes, we were Team Canada, but we weren't Team Canada based upon the players that were available. Team Canada was represented by only NHL hockey players. There were players that were that had already signed and gone over to the WHA. For instance, Bobby Hall, mm. Dave Keon, Jerry Cheevers, and that. Just th those are the first three that come to my mind that would have been part of that or uh, part of that team for sure. So, in, in essence, it was it was a Team Canada because we were all Canadians. Secondly. If you take a look at the roster there and then you take a look at the roster on, on Team Canada 76, I am going to say right now that Team Canada 76 wins that series. Oh, wow. Really? What makes yes. you say that? What makes you say that? I, I was fortunate enough to be part of both teams. But when you take a look at the starting lineups on both teams and you've got uh, uh, Marcel Dion playing in 76, you got Daryl Sittler playing on 76. You got a Gilbert Perot playing 76. You got Peter Mahovlich playing 76. You got Phil Esposito was still there. Bobby Clark was still there. They, th those are the players. The three, there were three centermen that played in both series that got to actually four because Gilbert Perot did play one or two games for us in 72. So now you got four centermen that played in both series. But then you had Daryl Sittler and, and Marcel Dion. Um, Key Lafleur, I think. Key Lafleur, right? Bobby Hall did not get to play in, in 72, but he plays in 76. And the very first game that we're playing, we're playing against the Swedes. And you know what he does? He runs over Borea Sami. <laughs> I remember that like it was yesterday. He And Bobby Hall did not use the body very often, but his passion for the for, uh, for what was going on as far as uh, representing his country, not being able to play in 72, knowing full well, you know, what we have to do here is represent our, our game and our country the, way, the best we can. And so all these things, if you take a look at the defense that we had in 76, our starting defense, okay? Serge Savard, Guy Lapointe, right? Denny Pontvin, Bobby Orr, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Larry Robinson, legend, and uh, Jim Wilson was our uh, uh, was the sixth defenseman on that team. 
Now, Bobby Orr couldn't play, right? And then, of course, we had Larry Robinson and uh, and Denny Ponta. So those are pretty that, – wow. that's why I say if you take a look at the lineups and you go down, up and down the lineups, yeah, we had some great – but we had some – we had so much character on 72. That was the thing. The, 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 the fact that what happened in Montreal that first night told us a lot, an awful lot about things. We were not prepared. Everybody that was on that team in 72, that first night, we weren't a team. We were Phil Esposito from Boston. We were Bobby Clark from Philadelphia. We were this guy from Toronto. We were that guy from Detroit. We were this guy here. The Montreal fans didn't understand that. And neither did the Toronto fans. And especially when we went to Vancouver, they had no idea. Because they started booing five minutes into the game. I was in the stand. It's the only game that I did not play in. And, and I was embarrassed. I bet. That's, that's awful. I was, I was embarrassed. Not, not for the players. I was embarrassed to be a Canadian. They didn't understand what, what this was about. Well said. Well said. Yeah, there must have been like you must have felt the change though during that time that how it, it kind of all changed and then everyone started to, you know, Canada, Canada, Canada. Like the the, the 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 transformation must have been amazing for you guys to be a part of and see. Well, it was and 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 I we did not I did not get to see the uh the comments or, or the video of, of Phil's speech probably for eight to 10 years later when we started to do the documentaries. So I had no idea. I was told that he had uh, gone off, gone off the way Phil does because Phil doesn't speak from his head. He speaks from his heart. Yeah. Yep. Right. And he's going to say, he's, he's not, he's not interested in, in, in your feelings or anything else. He's interested in his own feelings, what he really feels. And he wants to express those feelings. And if, and if it hurts somebody else's feelings, he doesn't, that's not the point. The point is I have to express the truth, the way I look at it, the way I see it. And again, it's, we're not, every person shouldn't be for all people because you can't keep everyone happy. There's always going to be someone out there that'll disagree with you. But one thing you can't change is your own opinion. And if, and if you're true to your heart and you give your own opinion, you will always be right because it's your opinion. It might not be mine, but it's your opinion. Right. See, and honestly, imagine social media was around then with Phil's comments. I would have loved that. The, the, the social media world would have loved that. And you're right about Phil. He, he, he's not shy to, to speak, but it's not because he's speaking out of anger, or not thinking before he talks. He's pure passion is what he is, you know, when he played that game. And that's what I don't blame him for his comments. I probably would have said worse, to be honest with you, like good, good on him for saying the more appropriate way to put it is that it's a, uh, it, like the way that you put it, Pete, it, it makes you feel like you were embarrassed because uh, not because of the way you're playing, because of the reaction of the fans. And then obviously you, Marcel, you, you, you know, part of that in 72 and then 76, obviously being, a tad bit different, and he mentioned a good point. Seventy six being uh, might would beat the team at seventy two, and I now double check the roster at seventy six, and you have Dennis Potvin and Bobby Orr being your top scorers on your team, and both of them defensemen. And I look, I look at your forward core, like like impressive, like like both teams were good, but he might be right with the. I would, I'm going to have to agree with the seventy six team looks a bit more dominant. But there's one thing. There's one thing that. Uh... You get a mention about 76, and I was fully aware about it. Uh, Bobby or should have never played. He was not healthy. He played on one knee, never practiced with us. He wanted to play so bad. And if you look at the history, he went back to camp, uh, failed uh, the physical, and was let go to Chicago, which never made any sense to see him in a Chicago Blackout jersey, no. which I love that jersey. But at the same time, uh, you watch the career end to a great, great player. And uh, he, he was there in 72 watching us. He didn't want to miss the bolt on 76. Incredible, incredible performance. It was. Now, you know, for, for yourself, Marcel, you know, you for being in, 
that and scoring a goal for your country and representing it. And, uh, and speaking of jerseys, you wore a pretty sick jersey in your time too. The Kings, that jersey with the LA Kings. Okay, that's the yellow brilliant. one. The, the yellow, yellow one is so yeah. sick. Okay, I don't have one. I used to have one as a kid. I got to find it. I was trying to find it for uh, the show and I was going to put it on, but it would have been more so like a crop top. And I didn't want to, uh, uh, you know, scare anybody off on the show here. Uh, but like back to that way, we'll talk more about LA and the times that you both played in the NHL for your team. But ultimately those were two series that uh, like really dominated, you know, the, the hockey world for Canada. And I, I know obviously United States, when they won an 80 against the Soviets, you know, they, after the eighties, that's when they started using NHL athletes and professional athletes for the Olympic games, you know, like the amateur athletes, if you will, from collegiate hockey, you know, they, they would play more of the world junior ranks. Right. And you, you know, that those part of the seventies and now the way how the NHL is part of it. And you think of this, Olympic coming up and you think of the roster that Canada can have with Crosby, McKinnon, McDavid, uh, and the list, the list goes on. I can probably do three teams, but if you line up the team that you guys had in 76 or some of the guys that you played with in the seventies and even going into the eighties, I would love to see a roster like that built against a team like today. That would be unbelievable. Okay. The The ultimate game, the the ultimate game, that would be something. (laughs) Well, the, you know what? There's an, here's what I'm going to tell you. It, it, it's great what you're saying. When I watch Connor McDavid, okay, he's the best player by far, by far. And uh, when he jumps on the ice, every time he jumps on the ice, he's only have one thing in his mind, and it's to score a goal. Yep. You can watch all night long. You watch any other players. When he gets on the ice, by the way, he will touch that puck three, four, five times. Mm-hmm. You watch most of the other guys, they're making 75 million, they're making 80 million, and you put the camera, he says, Where is he? I haven't seen him yet in the play. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. just focus. If you ever go and see him play anywhere, just watch him the whole game. You'll be, you'll say, he does things that nobody else can do. And that's what Wayne Gretzky did his own way. Crutched right. up, hiding behind a net. And everybody says, ah, if he would have played in the 60s, 60s, we would have hit him. Well, it's too bad. He didn't play then. But I played against him. And I knew when we tied for a scoring title, I said, this guy will be the first player to get 200 points in the NHL. And everybody, uh, well, he did. did. And now if they're questioning, if they're questioning his greatness, what's next? Is Mike David now can wrap up everything? I don't know. But you're watching a hell of an athlete. Mm-hmm. And now his only goal, and Pete's been there winning the Stanley Cup. I didn't. I watched my young brother winning. The ultimate, what he has right now, it's to win a Stanley Cup because Everything else he's got, the package yeah, deal. For them to lose four straight last year, guys, mm-hmm. it was hard to take. It was, <laughs> what's going on? But now they're off to a better start. They got a this, but he will win one. There's no doubt, but that's what, as a player, it's a team game. Yeah. And the ultimate is the cup. That's it. For sure. Well, Marcel, I want to, you know, kind of talk to you for a minute about something here is, you know, you're just talking about how he's, you know, he does everything and, you know, he's kind of changed the game a a bit in this modern era. And I know from watching you and, you know, hearing stories from my dad, because I know you guys know each other too, uh, you know, how, you know, back in the day, like you changed the game a bit because you use the boards a lot for passes, throwing them off the boards, beating the defenseman. You know, how did that come about, you know, to use the boards so much? Because I watch a lot of highlights and you use the boards sometimes as a line mate, it looked like, as how well, many times you used it. It's funny because I, I, I watch, uh, you know, five foot seven, and my dad was six two. So at my height, I had to find a way to play. And, and just to add to this, there's one thing I see a lot, how the players don't protect themselves right. And the boards are your best friends. You have to know, this is almost an extra man. If somebody's gonna crank you, you gotta get close to the boards. 
and bounce back. And those days we had hard glass. You get hit, that hurt. So now they're more flexible, right? And then he becomes an extra man. I love to touch the puck. Pete was like that too. I was a better goal scorer, but he handled the puck with Lafleur and Steve Shot. Some guys don't want the puck. They only want, set me up for one shot, that's it. They get nervous when they got it. Me, I said, give it to me, get in a hole, and I'll put it to you. But you know that you have a friend, and that's what you do. You have another sense where the players are, and that's the key. When you have a good line, if you're a good center, they're going to watch you. You're going to set them. If you don't have a good center, it's very difficult because it's, it's to feed the guys, right? Eh? But uh, for me, uh, I never got hurt on the boards getting hit. But you're right about that. I knew I had that level of play to play like that. And I'll tell you, when we played in Europe, remember this, that was a bigger ice surface, wider. Not as long, but we had the 80 feet compared to you, right? Yeah. So now you get so much more room to play. He says, are you kidding me? All the tough guys in the 70s that love to fight, they couldn't play. They couldn't play that big ice surface. It was more of the skill game. And what you have realized, everybody says, in the NHL, let's expand the glass and the ice surface because the guys are bigger. Well, you know what they do in Europe? I played there a lot too. You close the box. Lots, you let lots. guys pass in the pipe all over the place. Nothing happens. Then if you miss the net, it goes <laughs> a long way to go and get the puck. So now with the NHL, it's shorter, right? 80% or maybe 85% of the goals I scored within eight feet. Within eight feet, all the goals are scored. You got to move. You take a hit, you watch every night. In baseball, they shoot out a home run a lot. But in hockey, they're in tight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well said. Now, even uh, with with going to you, even uh, Pete, like you, he mentioned the four Stanley Cups, you know, and obviously you playing in Montreal uh, for it. You know, everyone knows taking my host hat off here for a second that I cheer for <laughs> Toronto. Uh, so, you know, 67 is the last time they won. I was born in 91. Do the math. I wasn't born. Uh, 54 years. My dad was three at the time. Uh, so, you know, there hasn't been a lot to really. So when you cheer for what Montreal did, but you got to give respect to Montreal, the players that they had. That includes your yourself, your brother, Henri Richard, uh, the Rocket, the, the Guy Lafleur. The list goes on. And obviously, I know Marcel knows Guy Lafleur pretty good because of the way they went in the draft that year. Uh, two very comparable players growing up. But yourself, Pete, winning those four cups, okay, and winning in Montreal, okay. I'm very curious. This kind of two part question. When you grew up in Timmins is where I think you were grew up. Did you grow up a Montreal fan or were you another fan? Secondly, okay, when you won the Stanley Cup, can you describe that feeling like like and win it alongside the players that you did win it with? Well, for, for me, growing up in uh, Timmins and Schumacher, I, I happened to be, of all things, a Detroit Red Wings fan. Mm. My favorite player happened to be Ted Lindsay at the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ted Lindsay, Alex Alvecchio, Gordy Howe. There they were. And, <laughs> okay. Now, we, we, Frank gets uh, uh, dry, or we get signed by, by Toronto. Uh, we moved from uh, Schumacher, Ontario to, to Toronto. So now I become a Toronto Maple Leaf fan. Be, not so much a Maple Leaf fan, but Frank Mahomlich fan. Okay. Well said. So, so I, I became a fan of the Leafs because of that. Um, and a little shout out to, to one of the all time great uh, Maple Leaf guys, Davey Keon. Yeah. Okay. I talk about a great human being and, and the way he treated me when I would go down on a Saturday morning with my brother, you know, uh, very respectful, you know, not running around this and that. But Davey Keon would always come over, say hello, do different things, and just make sure that I felt comfortable in, in that room. Uh, Frank being very quiet, shy, introverted. Uh, me, very extroverted, you know, as it was. But uh, 
all in all, it, uh, now we fast forward and we play together in Detroit, Frank and I. I get traded to, to Montreal. A couple of years later, Frank gets traded to Montreal and we go on in 1971 to win the Stanley Cup together. That's awesome. All right. Now, it was the last year that John Beliveau would play. We would win the Stanley Cup with John Beliveau. We would, but for me, to put things in perspective, Team Canada 72 was the most important thing for me. Team Canada 76 would be the second most important. And of course, my first Stanley Cup was my brother. We won two in there, but the first one was most important. We weren't supposed to win. We, we ended up beating Boston in seven games in Boston. We go into Minnesota. We beat Minnesota in six games in Minnesota. And the seventh game, we had to beat Chicago in Chicago Stadium to win that Stanley Cup in 1971. So that was a tremendous feat. To be part of it with my brother was another thing. When asked the most important Stanley Cups for Frank, not, not his first Stanley Cup in Toronto, but the first Stanley Cup with me in Montreal. Yeah. So that, to me, tells me an awful lot about how important it was for him to, to win alongside his brother. And, and I, I say the same in return. Wow. Brooks, yeah, I've taken some airtime. You can have a question. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I yeah, like no. logging airtime. Oh, Marcel. It, it's so emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's good that that ties is is really good. Sorry, Bruxy. <laughs> well, no, I just you well, know, and and, just... and and by the way, uh, by the way, when Frank got traded from Toronto, my sister put a curse on the Maple Leafs. <laughs> we never win a Stanley Cup while she's alive. She's eighty six <laughs> right now, and the bad news for Toronto is the doctors say she could live to be one hundred and ten. <laughs> I thought it was Henry. I thought it was Ballard's curse the whole time. <laughs> Brooksy. Yeah, no, I just, you know, I just wanted to talk about, uh, you know, Marcel and some of your NHL experience, you know, being, uh, you know, when you got traded to LA and, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, the hockey wasn't uh, overly big there in LA at the time. And I'm just curious, you know, what, what it was like and uh, how the reception was for you when you ended up going to LA. Well, uh, mixed emotion. Uh, I knew exactly what the deal was. And uh, LA just had, uh, before I got traded, uh, had a really good year uh, 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 prior to that. And then uh, Bob Pulford was the coach. And then suddenly, well, you get an offensive player. He thought this will change the whole concept. And uh, he liked to play, uh, play tight, tight hockey, right? But for me, I heard just prior to going there, how bad, not how bad, but it was tough to play there. Distraction, the weather, the beautiful ladies on the beach, uh, the food, the air party, the Hollywood, you name it. I made the decision that for two years, I would not go to Disneyland. I didn't go to Vegas. I didn't go to the beach. <laughs> stayed at my house. I didn't swim during the season. <laughs> Anything you can think. I did play tennis. You know what? It does work. I said, because Montreal was aggressive with that in the 70s. They weren't winning all the cups. So the sports writers would come in and says, you guys could never win here. I said, yes, you can. You're going to tell me I need two, three feet of snow for me to leave in the morning and to go at the game? It's not true. And look, ever since, Elias won two, Anaheim's won one, mm -hmm. uh, Tampa Bay went to three, two or three, uh, yeah. Carolina. Are you kidding me? That oh, was the no. old Dallas. That was the, the old myth of saying, oh, it's got to be cold. No, it doesn't have to be cold. It can be <laughs> just smiled and nice. So here's what it is. I've done that. You're at the beach, 72 degrees. You go up to Big Bear Lake and the San Bernardino Mountains. You go skiing, but in three and a half hours. What else can you have? But you still have to perform. You still have to play. You still have to make a, 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 a commitment to the game. I did that, and it was a great, but it's not 
Pete knows it's not made for everybody. It's not. It can grab you real quick. Because yeah, here's what commitment. Here's what it is. Your family and your friends, when they come and visit, they don't come to visit. They come down to stay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're not going sure. off. <laughs> but you have to entertain them. <laughs> See, and speaking of LA, Marcel, okay, and as you know, I'm gonna throw a little ad product placement here. Obviously, this edition is brought to you by Little Caesars Pizza and a little special out to another one of our sponsors, North Spear Brewing Company. They make a beer called Houndtown Golden Ale. And how that refers to this show is that the Triple Crown line, okay? The Triple Crown line is yourself, it was Taylor and Charlie Simmer. Charlie Simmer is an ex hound. That people may not know that fun fact. Obviously, people in the Sioux uh, should know that, but other listeners outside of the Sioux. Uh, so you had that line, the Triple Crown line, which is such a sick name in a good way because of the LA Kings, your jersey. It all just, it's like poetic. It's perfect fit. Okay, honestly, you were arguably the best line in hockey when you guys were together. Arguably. I know there's a guy named Wayne Gretzky that played over in Edmonton that had a pretty good couple line mates that were surfaced by a lot of Curry, Gretzky, etc. But... That line that you guys had, there's a book out, a two about it, I believe. I didn't get a chance to read the book. I believe it's a book. Uh, but, you know, that and playing it on a line that well and having that name, you established that presence in L.A. And your line and yourself, Taylor, Charlie, were a big part in helping grow the hockey in L.A., obviously. And then when you moved on from L.A. went to the Rangers, Wayne Gretzky came in a little bit after and continued the legacy that you all started. But for the triple crown line that must have been cool to have that knowing going around la yeah you didn't go to the beach for a few years you didn't party and all that kind of stuff but well uh, charlie 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 married married a playboy a playmate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry in the playboy the playmate and i'll tell you it was uh, pretty impressive was it pretty because impressive. of you on his line was it because but he never invited me at his house for dinner i don't understand that <laughs> there's what happened. when when you're talking about lines like there's there was a good one with Pete, the Fleur, yeah. Pete Scott. Well said. He got, he got the French connection. He got yeah, the gag absolutely. line. Some lines will go too far. But what happened, it's very, very difficult to put three guys together. Mm -hmm. It's usually you have good players. If you name me a line in the NHL right now, I said, you're going to have a tough time. So, but it takes time. As soon as I had those guys, I knew exactly what I got. I got Dave Taylor, up and down mucker, love to play. And that's the main thing. Got to love to play. Charlie Simmer was on his way out. He uh, got called up in Detroit. I scored four goals in that game. He had one assist. But I knew he was the guy. Because the four goals I got, he was in front of the net. It was against Rogi Vashon. And, and the people asked me, said that that game said, how could you score four goals to your roommate, ex-roommate, Rogi Vazan? I says, that was very simple. I says, who do you think? We, like he said, we didn't have any goalie instructors. I was his instructor. So when <laughs> I, shot, I was taking shots at him, Rogi. Pete knows him. Phenomenal guy. He says, am I giving you too much? Am I giving you too much? I would always lie to him. So that was my, my payback to him. <laughs> but a lot of great lines. Yeah. The problem with hockey, do you know, I never get to play against Wayne Gretzky. I never get to play against Kielofer. I never get to play. We have these checking lines. That's all they do. They grab you. They hook you. They just like, so if you score a goal, oh, well, that's expected. But they shut you down. What a checking line they are. <laughs> <laughs> A lot different now. They don't have – it's like, obviously, you, you got Matthews against McDavid, for example. They play against you sometimes. They're, there's different strategies. But you're right. Back then, it was, you know, more checking. They didn't, it wasn't really against each other, right? That was – Yeah, it was. But the, 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 the thing is that this one thing, it's very simple. It's a stick, and it's a puck. Mm. That's what you got. You got to play with it. The more you touch that puck as a line – the more chances you'll have. If you don't touch that puck, that means you're chasing it down your end, and that's not good. <laughs> See, and Pete, yeah, sorry, yeah. Unlike, unlike other sports, hockey's very unique in the sense that once the other team has the puck, you become a checker. Mm -hmm. 
you, you can score 100 goals. Yeah. But when the other team's got the puck, you'd better be a checker, right? The best player to me in the game today is Patrice Bergeron because he's the best two-way player in the game. Plays against the top centers all the time. Plays against Crosby. He'll play against McDavid. Plays against this guy. Okay? Talk about a great line. Pasternak, Marshawn, Bergeron. There's your top line in the league. Uh, different, different players, different reasons. All do something special. Yet, collectively, they, 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 both, they both are great offensively, and yet they're just as effective, if not more so, defensively. See, and Pete, you know, you were, you were known as little M is what they called you was little M. You're quite a tall guy to be known as little M to be honest. Uh, you, you know, but you also had, you talk about being an athlete and hockey and sports, but you also played baseball too, I think, right. Did you, and I did my, yes, I, did. And I think you played baseball, Yeah. you know, and how the big thing now in sports is mental health, right? That is the biggest awareness that's going around in sports. Okay. And we're getting, it's not that we were ever behind. I think it's just fair to say that now we're getting, it's more awareness, which means we're getting more education about it. That, that's the big thing. There's uh, more awareness to not only that, but our social responsibilities to our fellow man. Yeah. Has become like, well, when I was growing up, you, if, if your skin was not as tough as a rhinoceros, you would, you would end up crying all the time because the names that, that we got called were different things. I mean, I, I, I got called uh, Lurch. I got called this. I got called when I was growing up. All, all because of my size and everything else. And maybe I was a little awkward as, uh, you know, as a 14-year-old going to kindergarten. <laughs> 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 hey, stupid. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but and that's exactly what we did. We laughed at ourselves, and and then we would we would say something to the other guys, and they would all laugh. And the guy that just got abused by me, if he didn't laugh, then he would have his his own issues. But most of the guys, we all we all had nicknames for each other, so on and so forth, that you couldn't use today. No, I, you know, and and yeah, to me, but... rightly so, today. Because right. you know, people's too many people are sensitive, and we have to worry about people's sensitivity. Yeah, and that and that's the big thing. Where you, when you, when I reason why I big mention or the big reason why I mentioned baseball story is that athletes that are in the NHL play uh, like different sports. Where, for example, and I'm going right. this way, but uh, when the Leafs lost in Game Seven last year to Montreal, less than 18 hours later, Mitch Marner was golfing 18 after a seven game series where. You know, you get heckled online. Okay, social media is unbelievable. Okay, the way the comments come out, where I I can say that getting and playing that extra game of golf or baseball, or even just young athletes today, where they're playing hockey all year, their parents are pushing, pushing to play hockey. Maybe the kid wants to play, maybe not. But there's a big importance of having that break from the game. And just being able to, you know, play another sport where like, I admire where you play baseball. I love playing baseball myself. I think it's fun and it's different, you know, and it's a different crowd of athletes too. Okay. I play with guys that are six, six feet regular. I'm about six feet close to it. 300 pounds. They're big guys, but for some reason they crush balls. Okay. Like it makes no sense, but it's, it's, that's the beauty of sport in general is the different sports you can be a part of. And it's a big part of uh, ensuring that you're relaxed from a mental health perspective. How do we get there? We get there. Our mental health generally helps uh, if your teammates understand you. Yeah. And yeah. and 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 when when you know when you need a hug, whether it's emotional or physical, they're there to give it to you, right? Now we're we're talking about this at a time when, uh, you know, in many generational. Uh, probably the best goalie in the last 10 years has been Carey Price. No question about it. Well he's, been an, he, he's been an MVP, but he, he, he feels that he's lacking something because he had an opportunity to win a Stanley Cup last year and they didn't win it. But so what's he do? He takes it all internally and he takes it all upon himself and, and, and it crushes him. Yeah. So you know, why, why isn't somebody hugging him and letting him know that it wasn't, it has nothing to do with him it, it, because 
How many goals could he score? He can't score any goals. And when they lose one nothing, is it my fault? No. Right? Where's where's the hug there? Yep. And they, 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 I think they lost two games, one nothing to Tampa Bay, right? There was, year. A, there was close games, and I think they've lost one overtime too. And I know Kucherov was chirping yeah. them for winning the game in yeah. Montreal, but that's another yeah. story. <laughs> yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to, Kucherov would be a shish kebab. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not I, a big I, kid. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think the the support, and you know, you would know Pete and Marcel like. The, probably the best teams that you have are when you have that family camaraderie as a team. Uh, I know the best teams that I played on is like, you know, you may not all get along outside the arena, but when you're at that rink, you guys are family, you're brothers, you do everything together. And like you said, if, you know, one guy's upset, you pick him up. And I always found when you have that support, those were the best teams and probably the best memories I have from the sport of hockey. It's a, very, it's a very good point. You know, when people think like everybody loves each other when you're playing together. There's guys that get on your nerves really quick, right? You know what I'm talking about. But you're right. And where you are talking to me today, my experience of the game, I became a better person just because of the game. It made me tougher in the business world. I was never afraid. Like I tell you this. Every time I talk to kids today at school, and I always look for the smallest guy, I fall in love with small guys because I know what it's like to be a small guy. And I look at him and I say, what's your name? He says, my name is Carson. And I said, everybody picks on you, do they? And then he moves back and said, yes. I said, that's nothing. That's nothing. Let them pick on you. If they knock you down, get back up. They're going to quit. Still, guys, I said, by the way, if they chase you, run, run fast. I said, they want nothing will happen. It's self confidence. It is what it is. That's the way you are. But you know what? Just don't back. I'm like, oh, just stand there, take it. I said, no, if I hit you, and yeah, somebody called you this and that, and now you feel bad about it, I said, that's nothing. If I take my fist and I hit you right in the middle of the forehead, that hurts. So he kind of looked at me and said, now you understand. The ones that do this most of the time, it's just like pick on something. They don't have anything else to say. But for me, it made me stronger. And uh, I, when I watch this, like Pete tried to see to explain it, we all have our opinions. There's no such thing. When you're in a team, if something step out of line, when you have a good team, somebody will walk in and say, hey, can't do this. Can't do this. And you know, for coaches, you had some cross the line with players. Some of them, I knew I was good. They couldn't, they couldn't get me. But to some players, what they did was not acceptable. It's just like in a working world. You have employees that are great until the manager or the owner cross the line. Mm -hmm. It's devastating. They have nothing to fall back on. As players, we get paid, right? So you say, okay, that was a bad day. That was a bad game. But you got to get back on track real quick. And your teammates, my guys were really good with me. It, really good. And sometimes it doesn't go. You get in these slumps. You know what's the matter? I had Steve shut. Here's what he did. I never drank wine all those years in California until he got traded from Montreal. Steve was an expert in wine. Me, I was a beer, beer lover. <laughs> nice. He introduced me to wine. Guess what? I don't drink any beer anymore. <laughs> he was a wine connoisseur. <laughs> I'll tell you that. We should have been friends for years. We, uh, we talked to him uh, the other day, and I haven't seen him in a while. It's just like it was like yesterday. So that's what the game is. And when I was talking to these kids today, I watched them. I said, I was just like you. I was listening. I was all over the place. But we had something to fall back. That was sports. Yeah. Sports. After we went out, we played soccer, we played baseball, we played football. I asked the kids, they said, do you fish? Some of them don't even know what's fishing. <laughs> I says, are you kidding me? I'll take you fishing. I says, what do you mean? As long as I know where I fish, there's one fish, I would fish there. There's no fish. That's not good. 
<laughs> forgive me. And the kid said, well, why? He said, now it's me and the fish, and we'll see who's going to win. <laughs> I got my money on you. <laughs> and see, Marcel, there's one uh, extra thing I want to bring up with. You were playing in MSG, right? And now you're talking about uh, Luke Robitaille, Jimmy Carson. Take the floor. <laughs> well, basically, uh, two young players. And I always thought like that, that uh, you rebuilt the franchise with older players, the middle guys, and young guys coming, right? And, but it was never meant to be. I never had a chance to see a good young player who had access to good draft choices. We created all our draft choices, the young players. So how, how do you get a young player? How do you get a Gilbert Pro, right? So, so finally, it came down to uh, I could see my game sort of declining a little bit, trying to be the, the number one guy. It gets old after a while. But I want management to let me know. It's I'll play second line. Doesn't matter. If I go to Montreal, for example, I said, you got to protect me. If I only go and guys a couple of shifts, I said, they're going to, then that's pr the press, right? And they don't understand, they understand what I can do, then uh, that'd be fine. But they didn't want to get involved. There was all kinds of turmoil. So when I went to New York, it was not really my team to go there. I think Chicago would have been a better fit. Now you can beat a guy. In New York, they didn't have that. They still had a decent team, but they got a lot of turmoil. You know, there was like a revolving door. So when I went there, Phil was trading guys from left to right with Blue Nanny, his buddy. And just can't do that. There were so many guys coming in from Quebec and so on. So the team was not stable. And uh, I, uh, I could see how difficult Phil is out. Really had a lot of emotion. And sometimes he he made deals with emotion. He can't. You gotta assess. You gotta think about it. And but you know what? It was a fun place to play. I wish 23, 24 years old playing in New York. Are you kidding me? This is the you know about the New York Yankees, right? Yeah, yeah. Get the Mets down the road, and you let get the Islanders. Think of it. It's it's big. The fans are great. So it didn't work out to be the way it is. But at the same time, I'm, I'm glad about the experience. And uh, when I found out I was not going to play again, well, I, I, I went to the minor leagues. Nobody believed I, I could do this. I said, hey, I just want to keep my conditioning. Then I find out what it's like to play in the minor leagues. <laughs> it's one more thing you add to you. Resume, right? So I had the chance to see Pete. And the funniest part, I had a deal. I had to go back to New York. And I'm going to New York. I'm coming back. And Pete is back with Mr. Where are you going? He says, I just got fired. <laughs> <laughs> so, Love that. Love there's that. a goal. You know what, guys? When I retired, I didn't cry. I didn't go back anywhere. I was at work the next day. And that's that was it for me. I had enough. I didn't want to stay in the game. It was it was not made for me. I wanted to do things on my own. I didn't want to have somebody to fire me. I have a lot of businesses. They've been, they've been good in the sense that I didn't want to make the same mistakes that people that I worked for made. I tell you, that's the way to do it. You got to bring, you you got to bring good things. You got to fight for it. It was a mistake. It's a problem with the customer. You address it that day. You don't wait. And it still is my memory today. Love yeah. That. And, and that's so great that, you know, those are all like, you know, qualities you probably learn, you know, through sports, you know, fighting for everything. Like even in real life, like you're saying, like you, you're bringing a passion and heart, no matter what you're doing in business sports. And, and I know for myself, you know, you know, being an athlete and playing different sports, a lot of that all came from, you know, the passion I had and learned playing ice hockey for myself. Yeah. You know what? And, and there's another thing too that uh, it's uh, we kind of forget. I was lucky I played 18 years. And you remember this? It's still only five years in the NHL. By the time they yeah. drop 18, they turn to 23. They're done. Sure, they make a lot of money, but still, when you play a short career, there's a lot of catch up to do because it takes a long time to accept you can't play anymore. Now you have to recharge the batteries. And come out and see, 
Now you're part of the whole world. And it's very difficult. It's preparation, confidence, exactly what you're doing right now. Enjoy that. You might have good days or bad days, but you get back at it. Because the game gave you that. If you float, nothing could happen. If you did perform, win or lose, you did perform. Well said. Well said. And you scored 700 goals and 1,700 points. That's pretty awesome, too, I might add. <laughs> Brooksy, I know you had some yeah. for Pete. Well, yeah, that. no, I just, you know, Pete, you know, we've talked a lot of, about things here. And, uh, you know, I know, you know, because you've uh, known my father, you know, quite well or gotten to know him. And I know you have a lot of stories. And, you know, I'm just curious if you have a story that you – haven't been able to talk about today or something you can share with us from, you know, from back in the day, uh, you know, with the room with some of these amazing players like Guy Lafleur or anything. If, I'm just curious if you had a good story for us uh, that you could share with our listeners. Well, the, the, the one thing that uh, is pretty interesting is I, I got to play again, like I said, with Alex Delvecchio, Gordy Howe, the most impressive person that I ever played with. Besides, and, and believe me, I, I say this in, in all honesty, was my brother. But the other person that, to me, was John Bellable. If there was anybody uh, that I, I would say you look to and you say, you know what? He, he, he's the Pope. He's this. He's that. He was all things to all people, John Bellable. He was such a gentleman. Uh, he understood. He understood what what uh, management was about, but didn't explore it or didn't exploit it either. He, he he was a conduit between management and players more so than any other player that I knew. And uh, you know, talk Jean Belleville probably would say three or four different things through the course of the year. Not say much, but boy, when he started to talk, everybody in the room, there was not a sound to be heard. It didn't matter whether it was uh, Sam Pollock in the room or whatever. When Jean Belleville got up, got up to speak, everyone sat and listened. And uh, uh, But to your point, one of the things that was the most impressive thing that I'll never, ever forget was Sam Pollock. We're playing the seventh game against the Boston Bruins in 1971. We were big underdogs, and it was the seventh game, and uh, we're all getting ready, and Sam Pollock comes into the room. And Sam would never come in very often. So now Sam goes in, and he says, okay, guys, game seven. We have to play the game. So we might as well win it. Turned, a, turned around, walked out, and that was the end of his speech. <laughs> and you know what? John Belvo looked around. He says, seems simple enough. Let's go. That was it. <laughs> and that's, that's the way it was. Now, I don't want to say anything, but uh, my camera has gone on me. I've got to uh, take a health and wellness break on Zoom. <laughs> that's what came up. Where do yeah. I go to get the ca camera back? You're on. You're on. We can see you. You're oh, all good. right. Okay. You're as good. long as you can see me, I can't see you guys. Oh no. Okay. okay. Well, no. that might be. It might not be a bad thing not to see our ugly mug. So. <laughs> okay. As long as you can see me, that's good. I didn't know. But yeah. anyways, guys, I, I this has been a terrific hour that I've gotten to spend again with my good friend Marcel, and I appreciate the fact that you guys have did this, and hopefully we get a great response to it. And uh, down the road, if you think that uh, you would like to have myself back or Marcel back, I'm quite sure. He's got many more stories and many more things to talk about, as do I. Thank you so much. Oh, Pete, you know what? You do the closing way better than I do. I might hire you to always do my closings. They're a lot better, <laughs> they're a lot shorter, and they're a lot more effective. Uh, Pete, thank you very much. And Marcel, both of you, it's been an absolute treat, okay? Like, I, I am honored. You guys are uh, individuals that – and I, I, this may sound corny. I don't care if it does. But so you guys are legends. I look up to the both of you, though. Your impact in the game of hockey. Uh, and you know what? I still play Chell on PS5, even at my age of 30. There's a legends team on them. You guys are in the games. I might play with them more now because you guys are on those teams, okay? Like, 
honestly, it's been fun and it's been an absolute treat. And I, I'll let Brooksy say his thanks too before we go. Uh, to yeah. Well, you guys all said it all. I'm so uh, thankful you guys were able to come on. And, uh, you know, this is something uh, Dave and I are going to, you know, talk about for a long time. So thank you so much. Well, Thanks, guys, good luck to both of you going forward and whatever your uh, endeavors be. Appreciate that. And uh, Marcel, it's also been a treat to, for that too. And Marcel, Pete, we're definitely going to get you guys back on uh, in the future. I would be more than welcome. You come on as much as you want to come on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. That's awesome. Thanks again, Pete. Thanks again to Marcel. Brooksy, you know what? I'll say thank you to you, too, because you take the time, okay? And you dressed up a little extra nice for today. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Love that. I want to say thank you again to Pete, Marcel, Brooksy, and to everyone with the Game Entertainment Media, Game Sports Show family for all making this possible. And, of course, the listeners, uh, make sure you uh, hit like, follow, subscribe on whatever platform that you're listening on. If you're listening on, on this and seeing this video, make sure you hit subscribe on the video because now the Game Sports Show and the Game Entertainment Media is new on YouTube. We're on every platform. You search us, you can't not find us. Okay, we're everywhere. Okay, and we're going to be everywhere. And this show has been an absolute treat. So I'm here to remind the listeners that there's a lot of great content with our special edition uploads. There's many more to come. You can go to all the platforms, as I mentioned, or to the GameSportsShow.com or the platforms of the game entertainment media itself. I'm here to remind you to keep your stick on the ice, bring your bats, catch your touchdowns, drain your threes, and shoot your shots. Booyah.